Let's pray. Everybody pray with me. Father, we thank you that the word of God is sharp. It's powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. Able to discern between the bone and the marrow, the thoughts and the intents of the heart. The thoughts and intents of our heart. So today, Lord God, let the word of God with precision accuracy challenge us, humble us, help us, encourage us to realize all that you've given us through Christ Jesus. So we ask you for revelation and wisdom and knowledge in every person that hears this message, message both here and online. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So we've been on this story of Jacob, one of my favorites in the Bible, perhaps yours as well. If you've been here, as many of you have, I know through the summer, we've been having a lot of fun in this. This is segment eight. And finally today, I'm getting to the wrestling match. I, I had Greg and some others say, when are we going to get? Why did this happen? I said, we're getting there. Well, today we're going to talk about the wrestling match because most people, even if they don't know a lot of the intricacies we've discussed about Jacob's life, we're familiar with this wrestling match. And certainly today we'll talk about that. But you remember Jacob, we kind of uh, named him Heel, Heel Grabber, him and his brother Esau. Uh, he rips off his brother, steals a birthright. Because of that, he has to move away from home. Esau makes a vow, I will kill my brother. I am going to kill my brother. So Jacob thinks it's best. He leaves, serves his uncle Laban for about 20 years, for two wives. And then finally gets to a point where he says, you know, it's time for me to go back home. Time for me to head back to my homeland. And so the Bible says in Genesis 31, Jacob rose, set his sons and his wives on camels, and he carried away all his livestock, all his possessions, which he had gained. He acquired livestock, which he had gained in Padanaram, to go to his father Isaac in the land of Canaan. So last, not last week, but the week before, we, we kind of left off. Esau is traveling with his family and all of his goods, his herds and riches. And he's going back, as we found out a couple of weeks ago, not necessarily to see his father, even though I'm sure that's part of it, because they do reunite, and we'll get to that as well. I'm not sure how long we'll be on this story. It's going to be a while. But his main concern was to make things right with his brother Esau. And there's some things that take place in our story that make us think, because Jacob, in a message that he sends his brother when he's on his way, he says, go tell Jacob, or go tell Esau, rather, that his servant, Jacob, is here. You remember, he's the one that stole the birthright, and by calling himself a servant and referring to Esau as his lord, we see that he's kind of said, you know what, I, I realize that everything can't be about me in life. It looks like he's changed, and, and he sends ahead, and the Bible says, the messenger says, all these things that Jacob has available, finances, and it really looks like, and most Bible scholars concur, that Jacob is trying to convince Esau that he has the wherewithal to pay him back, if you will, for something he had done some 20 years later, to pay him back if necessary, and to make things right, to mend that broken bridge. And so as they're on their way back, they get to a certain place. Like I say, he's divided his family into two groups, because he hears from his messengers that Esau is on his way with 400 men. And we can see through other stories in the Bible that that looks like a raiding party. He's not coming on good terms. Of course, as we move through the story, we'll see that Esau did not want to fight his brother. But with what Jacob had experienced 20 years prior, I will kill my brother, remember the vow, and now he's coming with 400 men. He thinks that's it, it's over. He divides his household into two groups so that maybe one would be attacked and the other one would survive. And so Jacob began scheming and Jacobing all along. Which brings us to today. 32, 24. Then Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. A man wrestled with him. Now most of us, again, if we're familiar with this story, we know that something's about to take place. At the end of it, Jacob is injured in his hip he has a limp. We'll get to all that. We'll talk about it. But right up front, I want to talk about something. That I think this part in our story shows us, shows us that life has scars. Life has wounds. We've talked about that throughout this. How many know sometimes, many times, most times, 
those closest to us, even family members are the ones that wound us and hurt us the most. And, and so we face so many things, and so scars are like hieroglyphics. Again, emotionally, spiritually, but, you know, most of us probably have a scar or two. I think of myself, I've got a scar on my left arm here. Perhaps you can see it, but with this tattoo, you can't see it unless you're up close. Ten years old, almost lost my arm. Some will remember that, you know, your, your chain link fence, they didn't used to be crimped down on top. They had the, some are still like that, but the tops are like this. Grew up in Detroit in the 60s. Ten years old, I'm hopping the fence to go to my neighbor, and oh yeah, the arm is caught. Ten years old, there was so much blood, I remember saying to my mother on the way to the hospital, am I going to die? I thought I was. I thought it was over. I was dying. That much blood coming out of a ten-year-old arm? <laughs> You're dying. And I'll never forget that event in my life, and I've got scars, big long one on the inside of my knee, another one on the outside of my knee from junior high and high school, wrestling and football. Injured it really bad. Had to have surgery in my, just prior to 10th grade. So 10th grade, I'm in a full leg cast watching all of my teammates, including my twin brother, start and win games and I'm on the sidelines. And I couldn't wait to get back in next year and so we went and started spring training and <laughs> two a days. We already went through that football season started, but it's it's pretty it's pretty grueling. So we're ready and we're doing some drills prior to the season. And in this particular drill, you just race for the ball, one from either direction. Whoever gets there first picks it up. The other one tries to tackle him. And maybe you guessed it, a helmet to that knee was it. I never never hit the field again. And it was a wound. I've, I've gotten over it. But it's something I remember about my past. I've got a wound on my left shin, a scar that reminds me of my stupidity and God's faithfulness. I've got a lot of those emotionally and spiritually, but I've got this physical one. that All through my 20s and even up to my late 20s before I met my wife, Trish, we grew up in Grand Rapids, or we met in Grand Rapids. She was born in Minnesota, I was born in Detroit, but we met in Grand Rapids. And you may be familiar, I'm sure you are, with Grand Haven, beautiful spring lake. My father had a boat there, and all of that summer, I spent on that boat drinking way too much and getting way too buzzed. You say, why, Pastor? Because that's all I did. I've told those stories from this pulpit. I had no purpose in life except to get drunk and high and have as much fun as I could. And if you've ever been down there, I think it's called the Musical Fountain. Maybe they've changed the name now. But it's a great place to watch fireworks. And if you're on a boat, well, you get to sit right under them and they explode overhead. And so we were there. It's the 4th of July. Been drinking Jack Daniels and chugging it with beer all day, which was my normal. And I'm just wandering around in a drunken stupor. And my foot went through the hatch, which was glass, on the top of my dad's boat. And oh, yeah, big old chunk of glass stuck in there. Blood all over. I'm thinking of 10 years old, but even though I knew better in my 20s that I wasn't dying, there was plenty of blood. But it didn't matter. Probably should have gone and got some stitches. But no, just dump some Jack Daniels on it, <laughs> drink another beer. <laughs> Woo, we're partying today. So I've still got that scar. I still see it. 30 years later, still have it. I know you've got your scars. Again, natural, spiritual, emotional. And we may try to ignore, forget, or conceal our past. Christians are pretty good at that. We've talked about that so much in this story. It's one thing we believe here. Real people live in real life with a real God. and It's hard to do. We've got to work at it. But we want some real relationships, people that aren't afraid to admit their scars, their shortcomings, to pray with one another. I was spending time with a friend of mine yesterday. He said, thank you for letting me be so honest and open. And I said, that's the way we need to be. I don't know any other way because, listen, if all we do is hide things from one another, how can we confess our differences and fault 
and pray for one another. We can't. We're just trying to make everybody think, well, I'm that Christian. I'm always overcoming. There's no such thing, so just stop it. No such thing. Oh, I know there's some TV evangelists and others that would disagree with you, but many are just masking their own limp, their own wound. Because life has wounds. Life is hard, but God is good. Come on, somebody shout. And that's the thing, that even in our woundedness, even in shortcomings, even in disadvantages, even in disappointment, God is good and he's faithful. And we need to hear that message because our lives are so far from that much of the time. So after this wrestling match, Jacob, and we'll find out, many of us know already that he's wrestling God. I'll point out to you why the why theologians and Bible teachers believe that it is God. We'll look at a couple of points. But he walks away with a limp, and his limp tells no lies. It's kind of like a silent sermon. And if we're honest and we have things that we've been hurt in life, turn them over to the Lord, we may walk with a limp, if you will, the remainder of our lives, but we've been touched by divine grace in the process, which allows us really, to be able to minister to others. And that's the truth. You want to know where the anointing is rich and you're able to help other people. It's through the woundedness of life. Even Jesus, when he came to the disciples, what did he say? Look, it's me. It's my wounds. Now, I'm not saying Jesus still has his wounds. I, I can't prove anything like that. But when he walked the face of the earth 40 days roughly after his crucifixion and resurrection, he said, look, in fact, the early church, if someone came and said, I had a vision, the Lord appeared to me, they'd say, did you see the wounds? That was, if you study church history, that was a regular question. Did you see the wounds? But Jesus wears those wounds, I believe, as a reminder of victory. The Bible says, for the joy that set before him, he endured the cross. Jesus' highest anointing, the creator of the universe, came upon his life after his greatest wounding. And we're going to see in this story of Jacob, it is a foreshadowing of the crucifixion itself. I've often said this, in fact, I said it to my friend Greg here just a couple weeks ago when he asked me about the wrestling match. And some people may not like me for this, but I don't trust anyone that doesn't walk with a limp. I don't trust anyone that everything's great all the time. That's just me. If you're one of those perfect people and it's great all the time, then pre please pray for me. Please pray for me, because we already found out I don't know what's going on. But, uh, you know, we all need one another. And, it, it, and the only way good prayer and, and relationships comes, I know I'm staying on this a long time, is through honesty. Real people live in real life with a real God who's got the answers. Genesis 32, 22, and he arose that night. He took his two wives, his two male servants, his 11 sons, crossed over the four to Jabbok. He took them, sent them over the brook, and sent over the what he had, and Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. It's almost like it's a Bethel 2.0. If you've been following this story, you'll remember that Bethel is when Jacob was on his way, leaving, running from Esau. God appeared to him. Both in that apparition as well as the one we're looking at today, both times Jacob was alone. Both times Jacob, it was at night. And here we have, he separated himself from his family. You'll remember Genesis 28, the first time that God showed up and spoke to Jacob. He said, I will be with you. And I will deliver you and I will keep you wherever you go. I will be with you. A promise that Jacob, I'm sure, held on to. We found out in our last series, Images of Christ. There's a term that the Jewish rabbis say that the actions of the fathers are signs for the sons. And what does that mean? What's written in the lives of the forefathers in small ways is revealed prophetically and naturally in a larger way for the people of God. And so they're all reflections, all shadows. That's why we took time going through the Old Testament, titled it Looking at Christ, or, uh, yeah, not reflections, but images of Christ. 
Reading on, verse 24, Then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till the breaking of day. Now when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip. The socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. It's the only place in the Old Testament, these two verses, that wrestled is mentioned. That word is not anywhere else in the Old Testament. And the root of it is a noun which is dust, like the dirt of the earth. There's an old English idiom. It's called a, uh, something called a dust-up. It means there's going, to be a, there's going to be a fight. We're going to throw down right here. Things are going to get real right now. It wasn't just a little hustle, but this was a fight to the finish, tooth and nail. They were getting it on. And I believe that's why this word is used only this one time. In fact, we don't see another apparition of God in the whole Old Testament that is like this. Many other appearings, but nothing where there is physical contact. The closest that we come is when uh, God tells Moses he's going to kill him. But we don't ever see any evidence that there was a physical confrontation. Verse 26, and he said, let me go for the day breaks. But he said, I will not go unless you bless me. Do you have the grit and determination to hold on to the promise of God? Regardless of what you're going through? Say, I don't care what it looks like, Lord. I'm going to hold on by faith. I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to throw in the towel. I'm not going to get offended. I'm going to believe you until my child gives their heart to you. I'm going to believe you until this sickness is gone in my body. I'm going to believe you until that relationship is healed. I'm going to believe you for that financial breakthrough that I need right now. Well, God's the God of breakthrough. But we can't give up. We can't let our hope fade. We've got to trust God. So he says, I'm not letting up unless you bless me. But what an odd request to make of a stranger. I think that tells us, first of all, this is no stranger. This has to be someone that Jacob is familiar with. That's our first sign that this is God. Second sign is God is the name changer. We'll see in a moment, Jacob's name gets changed. You remember he did the same thing with Jacob's grandparents, Abram and Sarah. Abram's name was changed to Abraham. Sarai's name was changed to Sarah. Third thing is the man refuses to disclose his name. We see this again when the angel of the Lord appears to the parents of Samson and doesn't reveal his name. And so we have these signs, if you will, that this is God. And then finally, Jacob calls this place or names this place Peniel, which means face of God. Verse 30, so Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face and my life is preserved. This is none other than the Malak. Again, we found out in images of Christ. That last series we went through for a number of months, we were on that, that this is the Malak, the messenger of God, who appeared to so many in the Old Testament. But I believe this particular apparition is a foreshadowing of the incarnation, specifically pointing to a time when God would become flesh and blood and take the low road once and for all for you and I. Because we'll see in this wrestling match, how many think Jacob could have beat God in his own strength? Anybody? There's, no, there's not even a match here. Yet Jacob comes out victorious. Clearly to me a picture of Christ and what he did for us. Philippians 2. Who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery, speaking of Jesus, to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. This is what Jesus did for you and I. He humbled himself. Jesus, being divine, accommodated himself to human limitations. Again, here he comes, and God could have whipped Jacob with two hands tied behind his back. But he allows Jacob to win. Oh, there's a wound at the end, but Jacob does end up on top. I think what's happening here on the shore of Jabbok is nothing less than a glimpse of Calvary. Matthew 27, now for the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was a darkness all over the land. 
And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama Sabbath Johnny, that is my God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? Some of those who stood there, when they heard that, they said, the man is calling for Elijah immediately. One of them ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and offered it to him to drink. The rest said, let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And John's gospel says this. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. Bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. It is finished. Jesus took it for you and I. He took the low road once and for all so that you and I could be blessed in the blessings of God. Peter, in his great sermon on that day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit first came, he says, Him, Jesus, being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified him, and put him to death. It was determined purposefully. You'll remember in the Garden of Eden, chapter 3, the very original fall of man, God prophesies that the snake would wound the heel of the seed of the woman, but the seed of the woman would crush the serpent's head. And so we see God all through the Old Testament, certainly in our story today, looking forward to what he would come and do in the name of a God-man named Jesus Looking unto Jesus, Hebrews 12, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus' delight was his defeat. In his death, we have life. And to me, this is depicted so much in our story in Genesis 32. Verse 31, it says, Just as he crossed over Penuel, the sun rose on him, Jacob, and he limped on his hip. I mentioned earlier, I think life has its wounds. There's a quote that maybe you've heard. It's maybe not so popular nowadays. A.W. Tozer said this once. It is doubtful whether God can bless a man greatly until he has hurt him deeply. You may not like that, or maybe you're one of us that has been touched by the divine that realizes how true that is. Say, well, God wouldn't hurt anybody. He does in our story. And yes, it's prophetic. See, we live in a time, and you may not realize this, and I'm just going to be bold enough to say it, and I'm sure I'll have critics, but I already do. The prosperity message that we're all so familiar with, and there, there's a truth in it. Don't misunderstand me. God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think or imagine. God will meet every need according to his riches and glory. But see, what we do is we have created this prosperity gospel that doesn't talk about our weaknesses. We just kind of push those under the rug. And the gospel that we're familiar with, you won't see a quote like I just read because the gospel that we've heard preached really came out of World War II and the economic boom of this country. Oh, we're... The trap door is going to fall out on that one, I think, pretty soon. Who knows when? But Western civilization... The gospel that's preached, I don't believe, is a gospel that was preached in generations gone by prior to that. Oh, there's some truth in it. Don't get me wrong. Boy, if you don't trust God to meet your needs, then all you can trust is you, and you will come short, I guarantee you. You need his help, and you need to do more than you can possibly do. But unless we learn that we've got to accept the fact that pain comes in life, God allows it, God inflicts it, you don't have to agree with that. But I've had things in my life where it didn't go like I thought it would. People I trusted that deeply disappointed me. As a Christian, you and I are going to have to forgive and love people anyway. 
See, I want to be used by God. This is how it starts. Allowing God to touch you deeply in your wound, whether self-inflicted and inflicted by others, but allowing him, and here's the thing, in our decrease, we actually gain increase. When we realize when I am weak, then he is strong. That we're weak, but we don't have to stay there. That even like Jacob, we may walk with a limp, but we gain the victory through Christ Jesus, our Lord. But I believe it happens in its fullest potential when we realize how short we come in ourselves. He walked with a limp. In fact, Paul Paul had his limps. He said, he went to the Lord, he said, let this messenger of Satan depart. I can't take it anymore, Lord. And God said to him, my grace is sufficient for you. Maybe you know this. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. There's a whole gospel of suffering. Peter talks about it. Paul talks about it. We don't hear it a lot. The good news is we don't have to stay in a suffering situation, but there is suffering in life. And I don't know what you're going through, and you, maybe you haven't ever suffered. You will. I'm, I'm going to tell you, life is not all roses. Somebody said, you know, every rose has its thorn. Every rose has its thorn. Whoever that band is, somebody, somebody said it was Axl Rose or something. Oh, who? Poison. Listen, what do you guys do on Saturday nights? That's what I want. That's what I want to know. Holy moly! I remember that song from back when I was, you know, doing dumb things like falling through hatches on boats and cutting my leg. Back to our story. So he said to him, what is your name? He said, Jacob. And he said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel. What is your name? I was just talking with a close friend of mine just the other day. And he was telling me how the Lord asked him a question. And he kind of moved on in our conversation. I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. There's something I found out a long time ago. Perhaps you have as well. When, when God asks you a question, <laughs> it's not because he doesn't know the answer. God asks you a question so he can help you open up to that area in your life that only he can work in. I found that out. And that's what I'm talking about. We're surrendering, letting him touch that wound. So he says, what is your name? God knew Jacob's name. Let's read on. For you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked, saying, tell me your name, I pray. And he said to him, why is it you ask my name? And he blessed him there. Of course, the Malik, the messenger, Jesus, doesn't reveal his name. But Jacob's name, Israel, means this. The God contender. The God contender. The one that fought with God and won the one that wrestled with God and won. And it's such a message for every single one of us. And it, even though it's not the only time we see in Scripture where God changes someone's name, it's the only place in Scripture where someone's name is changed, yet they're still referred to by their old name as well. Abraham is never again referred as Abram. Sarah is never again referred to as Sarai. But throughout the Old Testament, more times than not, Jacob is still referred to as Jacob. Oh, he's also referred to as Israel. Jacob is his name, his wound, if you will. Israel is the work that God did through his life. And you and I can have the same thing. Oh, God's not going to birth a nation out of every one of us. That's not what I'm saying. But God will do great things, and he's not just giving you a new name. He's giving you another name. It's powerful. See, when God looks at you, he sees Jesus. 
Oh, he still sees Andy. Because he knows Andy needs his help, but he sees Jesus. So you're now Andy Jesus. <laughs> because that's how God sees you. Jacob, heal, contender, God's contender. And again, so we see how the gospel is so presented in the Old Testament. I love these stories because the gospel is there. Hidden a little bit, maybe, for many Christians, but it's there. It is there. Verse 32, therefore to this day the children of Israel do not eat the muscle that shrunk, which is on the hip socket, because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip in the muscle that shrank. And a kosher Jew to this day will not eat the part of the animal. It's, they still stick to it. And you may say, well, that's an interesting tradition. Well, it's because the father, when they would butcher their animal, a child may say, why don't we eat that part of it? And the father could say, oh, let me tell you a story. Let me tell you a story of when a man wrestled with God and won. See, you and I, we wrestle with God. Let's just be honest. But you know when Jesus, we win? Say this, I, 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 I win. win. Not in your own strength. In his strength. It's okay to admit that you're weak. It's okay to admit that you've got some rough edges. We all do. We all got a history. We've all got mistakes. We've all got wounds. See, Jacob limped into his future bearing the burdens of his past, I really believe. He never fully recovered from his encounter with God. And I know there's been things in my life, I've said it, but I'll say it again, where I've been terribly disappointed, even upset with God. But you know, if I turn to him and truly wrestle with him in prayer, he shows me how good he is. Even though I didn't get the answer to that prayer, don't give up if you didn't get a specific prayer answered. I'm going to have the worship team come back up here in a moment. You may be here today and you haven't seen a prayer answered. If we can be honest, many of us have. Oh, we've seen the goodness of God. By all means, you walk with God, you see his goodness from the very first day he touches your life. But as you walk for a while, you find out, well, that didn't, I think the worship team's coming up. Did, did I just say that? Oh, in a moment. Okay, this moment. Too many things going on. Announcements. That's why we don't do announcements. I forget where I am. That's why we send out videos. Back to the anointing. I'm not saying give up and don't allow God to have a breakthrough in the future. Don't give up on that promise. But allow God in that wound to bring his divine touch. Only he can do that. Only he can. And it comes at a place of surrender, the cross. Realizing that, hey, I'm a sinner. A lot of Christians don't want to talk that way, but I'm telling you, we're missing God's best. Oh, now we don't stay sinners because he's changed us on the inside. How many know you can't get to heaven because of your sin, but he took it away. But we're still sinners by nature. In fact, I'm going to read a passage of scripture in context. And in light of our story, maybe you've never read it this way. I pray that it helps us all. Paul the Apostle is writing his letter to the church in Galatia if you don't know the history, the Galatian church started off in the spirit but then wanted to put themselves back under the law. The traditions, the Israeli ways, the Jewish ways. And Paul's saying, no, 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 no. Nothing wrong with any of that. Celebrate the feast days. Celebrate the Old Testament. But you're not under the law. Somebody say grace. See, when we understand grace... Then we can celebrate those feast days, those new moons, those Sabbaths, in light of Jesus and not our own good works, which is what the law was. In fact, let me read this. Galatians 2, but if you, while you seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners. You see that? Paul wrote this. Is Christ therefore a minister of sin? No, certainly not. See, just because you're a sinner doesn't mean 
that you're not marked by God. You say, well, boy, if, if people saw my faults, they'd never want Christ. Oh, no. They'll want him more. Because they see God touch someone imperfect, that means there's hope for them. We think being a polished Christian is the way to win the loss. I disagree. Now, we need to develop, and we shouldn't be stuck. God wants us to grow in holiness. We talk about that. But that never qualifies you to be used by God. What qualifies you and I are our weaknesses. That's why I say I never, maybe I said it already, I'll say it again. I don't trust anyone that doesn't walk with a limp. Someone that isn't afraid, someone that's, that isn't afraid to admit their weaknesses, that's a person I'll trust. If I build again those things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I, through the law, died to the law that I may live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. Christian, don't think that your imperfections, weaknesses, and failures disqualify you for the blessing of God. They qualify you. If you don't allow those things to qualify you, then Christ died in vain. If we evolve into this perfect people, then why would Christ have to suffer? Why would he have to die so that we could live? We can never forget that. In all the things in life, the only way that we will get value out of our woundedness is to realize that there's a victory in Jesus. So I'm not ashamed of my scars. They tell a story. But my ultimate story is God. With every head bowed and every eye closed. Maybe you're here this morning, you don't know Jesus. I'm not talking about joining a church. You know, that's not what this is. I'm not asking you if you've ever been to church. It's not what this is either, even though those things are important. Do you know Jesus? Do you know the goodness of God that says you don't have to be good enough to get to heaven? Oh, yeah, that's the gospel. Because you can't get there on your good works. If that's you today, you can come forward when we have this altar call. There's prayer people that will be down here. I encourage you to tell them, hey, I want to know more about Jesus. If you're online, you say, I want to become a believer. We're going to ask you to take a bold move and tell somebody, hey, I, I want to pray that prayer. That's why we say come forward as we pray, as we worship. If you need prayer for anything or if you just want to come down and humble yourself and allow God to say that my grace is sufficient that you and I are made perfect in our way. Just to be weak, just to bow and to say, God, I embrace my scars, but I know that you are greater than every hurt, every shortcoming, every misfortune, every missed opportunity, every prayer that I have not seen answered. I'm going to declare your goodness, your faithfulness all the days of my life. So if you need prayer for any of those things, I encourage you to move forward. Contact us online if you want to know about making Jesus Lord of your life. We'll get that information to you. We're so glad you stopped by the website today. We pray the teaching you just listened to impacts you in a way that helps you on your spiritual journey. Please take time to check out the rest of the website. It is full of information about our church, as well as resources to help you in your walk with Christ. If you have not already attended one of our worship services, we hope you make time to visit us in the near future. Everything we do here is designed with you in mind. The Bible says your real life is found in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. All of our activities point to one thing, our mission statement. Real people living real life with a real God who has the answers.